I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And I don't know if everyone's in Nashville or not. It's a gorgeous day. So, um, you know, you're, you're choosing to, to be here with Zoom, or you could be like Adele, who's also outside and choosing to be on Zoom. So, um, uh, so we want to welcome you. This is uh, really looking forward to Kathleen Wiley, very engaging speaker. And she's going to be talking about the importance of embodiment for individuation. And before we introduce her, just a reminder to keep yourselves muted. Um, unless now she is open to getting comments uh, and questions throughout her lecture. So uh, we'll be looking for your hand waving or chats uh, or the little uh, uh, hand waving icon. So feel free to use you know any of those options. And uh, our board member, Gail Prilliman, she's going to introduce Kathleen right now. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kathleen to our community today. She is a Jungian analyst that currently lives in North Carolina. She has a private practice uh, who, and works with individuals and couples. She's also a senior analyst with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in Memphis mm -hmm. and on the faculty of the Hayden Institute in North Carolina, uh, which is where I first heard her speak several years ago. They offer two year certificate programs in spiritual direction and dream work. Kathleen's focus is on empowering individuals to live from a conscious connection to the larger self or the God within. And there are two things about Kathleen I just have to say. When I first heard her speak, one was her ability to explain very complex psychological concepts in understandable language, which I deeply appreciated. And the other was her energy and what she has to say about energy. I think Kathleen, the first time I heard you speak, you were barefooted and you moved constantly across the front of the room and it was wonderful. The energy was palpable. I feel barefooted, but I have to confine <laughs> how far I move since it's virtual. <laughs> I have to stay That's true. <laughs> I have to stay on camera. But you also have that uniquely Jungian uh, depth and breadth of knowledge and understanding about world religions, philosophy, history, science that I so appreciate. Um, and for those of you who may be interested, she's currently offering an in-depth, online, experiential class on essential embodiment practices through her website, Inner Divine Spirit. And I'm sure she'll be happy to answer questions about that. Um, we are very happy to have Kathleen with us today and look forward to learning more about embodiment and just how young understand that to be essential for individuation. Thanks, Kathleen. Oh, thanks, Gail and Karen. And thank you all for being here. Um, as Karen said, it's a gorgeous um, Sunday afternoon, even here in North Carolina. So the fact you're showing up to um, let me see your beautiful faces uh, makes a difference. We were talking before we started about how presenting virtually, I've presented both ways to seeing people in little blocks and I've presented to not seeing anybody. And it definitely does make a difference to be able to see people. So even if you aren't visible now, if you at some point make yourself visible, if you have a comment or a question, it, it does make a difference for me. So um, I want to begin by reading you and sharing some quotes that Jung of that come from Jung's collected works about the body. And part of what I always say to people, and I say to the training candidates that I supervise, therapists who are working in the process of becoming to be Jungian analysts, is that if you're really doing Jungian analysis, it is more than talk therapy. That it is actually an energetic exchange. And today, I hope that by the end of our time together, you're going to understand what I mean by that. Because 
if all that's happening is an exchange of words that are being heard and taken in through our cognitive brain functioning, then we are totally lacking connection to the, to the heart and essence of what evokes change, and that is emotion. And emotion lives in and arises from the body. So we're going to be talking about that. And um, I do have the source where Jung himself says that um, without the emotion, the work with images and the work with the archetypes that are so seductive, which is why most people are drawn to Jungian work, um, don't have power. That it is that felt sense you have. So I'm going to start. The Tao Te Ching says that you need to know, you need to have the end in sight when you begin. So I want us to have the end in sight as we begin today. And Jung says, quote, only if you first return to the body, to your earth, can individuation take place. And only then does the thing become real. Only if you first return to the body, to the earth, can individuation take place, and only then does it become real. Individuation, as I'm sure you all already know this, is Jung's term for describing the process through which one fulfills the potential that they uniquely are. Fulfilling the potential that you uniquely are. And we all are unique in our appearance. If we just look at the images of those of us in the little blocks today, no two of us look alike. <laughs> Even if some of us have similar hair color or similar face shapes or this or that, we're all unique. We each have an essence that if we do not embody it, then it will not get embodied. And Jung in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections says that if we do not embody the essential we are, then life is wasted. That if we do not embody the essential that we are. So the essential that we are lives within the body. So I'm going to invite you to start with me for a couple of minutes of checking in with your body. So just wherever you're sitting, however you're sitting, or if you're moving around listening, just pause for a couple of minutes. And I invite you to close your eyes or let them just rest gently on the floor or the table in front of you. And I want you to bring your awareness to your breath. The quickest way to begin to take our attention and energy inside our body is to begin to put our focus on our breath. So just let yourself take a few moments as we're all silent together to begin to notice your breath. You don't have to try and change your breath or make it do anything different, but just notice it. And as you notice your breath, let yourself be aware of whatever sensations you're experiencing as you breathe. Perhaps you become aware of a moist warmth entering your nasal passages. Maybe you Focus on the rising and falling of your chest and diaphragm. Maybe you become aware of how your shoulders automatically relax or you settle into 
your seat a little bit more or your feet. Just continue to notice whatever's going on inside of you as you are aware of your breath, that process of taking in and letting go. Now I want to invite you to direct your attention to your feet. And just beginning at your feet, continuing to be aware of your breath, notice what's going on in your feet. Pay attention to the temperature, to tightness, to a sensation of being held if you're in shoes, to the felt connection to the floor, whatever sensory information, both physical senses, but also the inner spiritual senses of noting what's going on in your feet. And then come on up your body to your ankles and your heels. And then move up your calves and your shins. And if you're finding it difficult to zero in on those body parts, you might imagine that as you breathe, the breath goes directly to that area of the body. That's a helpful tool for tuning into these parts of our bodies we rarely pay attention to unless they're screaming at us in pain. And then come on up to your knees, your kneecaps, the surrounding sides, as well as the back of your knees. Working up your leg, the backs of your legs with your hamstrings coming up the front of your legs. Coming up into your thighs and your glutes and your buttocks. And take a few moments now to breathe into your pelvic floor and your lower abdominal area with all of those organs there that just do their thing automatically for us that we don't think about. Again, unless they're not working, quote, properly, unquote. Come on up, noting your lower back and your mid back. And again, that entire middle region of your torso with your stomach, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, all those organs that are in there. You don't have to know their location, but just breathe and feel whatever that part of your body has to say. Coming on up to your upper back, your shoulder blades, your chest, your heart, your diaphragm, your lungs. Working down your arms and just noticing what's going on there. Down into your hands, your fingers. And coming back up your forearm and moving back up to your to the tops of your shoulders and your neck. Again, in the process, being aware of whatever sensations may be going on in your throat or any of the area 
around it. And then bringing your focus up now, your, the back of your skull. Noting the area around your ears, that TMJ joint, the crown of your head, and coming up the front of the body with the chin, the jaw, your cheeks, your nose, your eyes, your forehead, and up to the crown of your head. Now I want you to do something at this moment, still with your eyes closed or resting gently before you. I want you to extend one of your arms out in front of you at arm's length and just make kind of a semicircle from front to back and just notice whatever you sense in that area of your energy field. I know that may sound a little crazy, but just do it and see what happens. And then just again for fun and for experimenting, do the other side. Extend the other arm and do the same thing. And again, we're just, we're experimenting here. There's so much that our body picks up if we just listen. And now just bring your body back in, your focus back into the center of your body. And just pull in all of what you have experienced all of the information, the ahas, or if you've been bored, whatever you've been feeling, if you felt like, when's this gonna be over? Pull all of those feelings in. And I want you to imagine that there is this little bitty, deep, deep inside of you, right around kind of behind your navel, a center point. And just imagine all of what you've experienced coming back into that point. Kind of as if you've got a, um, there are little threads that are coming back into that center. And then I want you to take three deep breaths and just slowly open your eyes. But hang on to that sensation of that little ball of energy with those golden threads that's deep, deep in your center. So I'm curious and I want to invite you either to raise your hand and, will, and Karen will unmute you or unmute yourself or put it in chat. What do you feel now? that's different than what you felt as we were getting started. I'll offer something. Yeah, Hi. Uh, I think I did not realize how sleepy, or not, I'm not sleepy from this exercise, but I hadn't been resting very well the last couple of nights. And so I'm noticing like, wow, I'm deeply tired. And I didn't feel that before I sat down uh, as well as, um, yeah, just a lot of maybe caffeine or energy, like both of those things at once. So that's what I noticed. So. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. And I want to say about this, our culture has an obsession with go, 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 that has prevents us from recognizing our deep, deep need. And in this case, a deep, deep need for rest. So when we slow down and we really listen, we begin to hear these things. And sometimes the reason we don't want to slow down is because we really don't want to hear it because if we hear it, then we may have to do something about it. <laughs> we want to ignore it. So I, I really um, appreciate that you're hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Michael. Oh, 
Yeah, I'll add something. I really felt this with my arm out there. I realized it's like palpating a space. And the, my immediate sensation was I'm, I am aware of this space, but it, it didn't become so conscious is that it's actually like a palpation, like something actually from my hand. But that was a very strong feeling for me. It's like, this is an area I do know, and I, but I don't, I don't consciously note it as that exercise yeah. provides. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, various types of energy work talk about, um, they talk about, you know, the, and they all have their own words and languages for it. But then in addition to our physical body, we have an emotional body, we have a mental body, a causal body. Again, different energy theories have different um, words they put on it. But the reality is that the reason that we sometimes, um, you know, the whole concept of personal space, the reason that personal space is an issue is because we do have psychic energy that extends out at least 18 inches be around us. And so we pick things up as, as people get close to us, even though there is no physical touch that we sense with the physical body. But there's something in us that picks it up. Yeah. The uh, the inner chatter goes away, the oh. the the sort of directing of narrative. I think it's related to Natalie talking about how she noticed suddenly noticed she's how she, her body's feeling. You know the the sort of we you realize that you're telling yourself a story at all times, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that that effect diminishes and you become much more receptive. I think after meditating. Yeah. Absolutely, Alan. You know, people talk about wanting to go away to have um, renewal and spiritual experiences. And all we have to do is stop long enough and focus on our breath to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Carlene, were you raising your hand? No. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to add what? Yeah. Catherine. I had a really unusual experience, which was very rich. Um, right at the very end, when we were talking about pulling things, everything here in the center, I realized that my image of that is of things going out. And it really struck me that this time they were coming in. And it kind of made me wonder if that's a part of a process of integration because mm -hmm. I focus much more on, as I said, things going out, but not coming in. Yeah, yeah it is definitely a, a process of integration. You know, one of the things that, again, in our culture does not do a good job at is helping us learn these cycles of sending out and coming in, of expansion and contraction. And part of why for me the body is so important is that um, the body is where we live and it is our limitation. And in the esoteric spiritual tradition, the Western mystery tradition, they talk about the principle of right limitation. Right limitation meaning living within the parameters of your psyche of your body mind and you know a simple example of that is that my husband is a folk musician and he could you know at four o'clock five o'clock in the afternoon he's ready to go all you know till till midnight and you know by six o'clock at night i'm like okay can i go to bed yet you know it's like i want to be in bed by nine because i want to be up at five well he'd no more get up at five it's like, what are these natural, unique qualities to us, the limitations of who we are as a body mind? And, you know, we all have natural rhythms. And that's just one example of something that, again, we know from science, we can, we can talk about. But yeah. Anybody else want to share?
Okay, so let's talk for a minute. This is a good, what, what Michael shared is a good place for us to launch into some things that Jung said. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about, and I'm going to do a screen share here with my PowerPoint. Let's see. Okay. So let me find, here are my errors. So Jung says that life, the human life, is actually created between the opposites of spirit and matter. That somewhere in this in-between zone of spirit and matter, of nature, matter, and what gets associated with the gods, the human being is created. And most of you, I'm guessing, have some familiarity with Jung's concepts. And one of his primary tenets of how these opposites get, get fleshed out in the human psyche, which includes body, is through the archetypes and instincts. So you can see here these, it's actually, we got a double rainbow. Do you see the faint rainbow up top? I thought this was so perfect for this, to, to exemplify this. Jung said that if we really knew the body and the mind are different densities of the same energy. And he says that the living being that is the quintessence of life in the body is the same as the material being, that which biology and science can track in dense matter. And he says that spirit is the quintessence of life in the mind. Spirit in this case being represented by the pole of the archetype. Matter and that which is biologically determined being represented here by the instinct. Instinct and archetype are the same thing. They're just different densities of energy. This is so, so important because, again, one of the appeals of Jung's work to people, let me hide that for a minute, is to fly with the archetypal images. But Jung himself said in 1959, only when archetypes come into contact with the conscious mind and they fill with individual content, only then can consciousness apprehend, understand, elaborate, and assimilate them. Okay. Archetypes that are related to as something disembodied miss the point. I'm going to get out a screen share for a minute. Okay. What we are looking at and what is important to know as we think about the importance of the body and in individuation is the body is the place where the archetype and the instincts come together as one. The instincts give us the impulses, drives, wishes, all of those kind of automatic impulses that we associate with the desire nature and the passions. The archetypes give us the corresponding images that we associate with those instincts and the ideas and the possibilities that get connected to them. So for a minute, let me talk about this. There's, there's a little essay Jung wrote called um, The Psy Psychological Factors in Individuation. And in that, he talks about five instincts. He calls the instincts psychological factors. And he says there are five instincts, hunger, sexuality, movement, and I know next month you all are doing dance, movement, self-reflection, and creativity. Okay. Now, I bet when I mentioned all of those, 
various images and felt sense came up in relationship to it, right? So when I said hunger, it evokes certain things, right? Sexuality brings up different kinds of pictures. Movement. So self-reflection and creativity. So the instincts and the archetypes travel together. It is when they get separated that we personally get lost. And when we get lost, we are in danger then of dissociation, becoming psychotic, which means we have no ego to mediate what's going on. We are just tossed to and fro by archetypal images. What does that look like for the average person who never gets a diagnosis of psychosis? It means they have, quote, hysterical emotional fits. <laughs> Men usually don't get labeled that way. They usually get it, it through their anger or moodiness. Okay. The archetypes first and for foremost manifest themselves through our affects. So I'm going to go back to my screen share. And as I'm going through this, if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it into the chat because I'd rather, I'd rather if I'm not making sense or I'm not clear that you ask me as we go. So I'm going to back up and talk about Jung's model of the psyche for a minute because again, I don't, I don't know what familiarity you all have, so I want to give us kind of a common starting ground here. Jung's model of the psyche is normally drawn in an oval, and I have those diagrams too, but over the last few years I've started doing it as a pyramid for several reasons. The primary reason is it makes it very clear that the self, the totality of psyche, which for Jung he said is the part of God that God put in us so that we would know that there is a God, is always larger than anything else. What does that mean? That also means the unconscious is also always larger than our conscious self. This is an important thing to remember because if there is a goal of Jungian analysis, it is to build a conscious relationship to the unconscious. And in the process, what gets forged consciously or cleared as a channel, conscious channel of communication, is what Eric Neumann called the ego self-axis. This means at any given moment, once this line channel is cleared, meaning we've resolved our own unconscious personal historical issues, <laughs> and we're paying attention to what's going on in our body, then at any given time, when we need to access something deeper and more than the surface perceptions or our logic and intellect alone can give us, we can tune in to that center that Kitty pointed out to us where we pull things back in and receive the necessary information for the next step that we're taking. So just real quickly, the unconscious in Jung's model, right down here, is considered the objective psyche. That means it is something that exists with its own natural templates and laws or operating principles. The personal unconscious is where those natural laws and principles get fleshed out with our own individual experience. And a lot of people use the term shadow, but Jung says the shadow is the personal unconscious. So I included that term here, but I included only to remind myself to say to you <laughs> that the shadow equals personal unconscious. And then in the personal unconscious is where we encounter the complexes. And we're going to talk about those, and I'm sure some of you are already familiar with that. I should have started down lower below that to say it is from the collective unconscious that archetypes and instincts arise. What that means is that by virtue of the fact we were born human, we all have this reservoir of energy in us that um, has have common themes, the themes being the archetypes and instincts. So if I go back to those five instincts, hunger, 
sexuality, movement, self-reflection, and creativity. Those are like the archetypes and instincts in the collective unconscious, but each of us have our own unique relationship to those that got forged vis-a-vis -vis our experiences in the outside world, particularly with early caregivers, and also that which is innate within our own physiology. I have started including body consciousness, or as you note, I put unconscious here, in my diagrams of Jung's model of the psyche, because I think it needs to be drawn attention to. In psychology, Freud said, and every other psychologist has agreed with this, that the ego actually begins with the body. So that an infant child only has a sense of body. They don't yet have an ego that's conscious in the sense of being cognitive or being able to think or that it's independent of those automatic processes of the body. So I started making a distinction in my diagrams of Jung's model of psyche in order to help us all realize how important it is that we pay attention to this channel because you cannot get to the self without going through your body and through your own personal historical self. You can't do it. You cannot fly around. You know, if I do a circle, you, you, you just can't go that way. You have to go down, which means we have to be in our own self. And that, of course, starts with body. Ego, of course, is conscious, our conscious self. It's all that we associate with I. Personas are roles that we play, mask we put on. The persona gets a bad rap, but I want to say this. From a Jungian point of view, the persona is the psychic structure that mediates between the ego and between collective consciousness. So right now, I'm in my persona of teaching analyst. And that's what you want me in, and that's what I want to be in. You don't want me to show up here in my bathing suit and be in my persona of tourist or vacationer. That would totally sidetrack what we're doing. The persona in and of itself is not bad, but where it becomes problematic is when the ego, when consciously, that's all we value, that's all we feed, that's all we give attention to, and we have no sense of ourself as separate from that. We have no sense of all of this rest of what goes on inside of us. Or we have a sense of this, but we devalue it. Okay? So, persona is just a psychic structure. Often, people in the first half of life, as they're building careers and they're starting families, get overly identified and overly invested in a persona. And again, that's when it becomes problematic is when it's one-sided. And then, of course, collective consciousness includes everything in the outer world that we take in vis-a-vis -vis other people. Okay. So... So I'm going to come back here. Are there any questions about Jung's model of the psyche that you want me to clarify right now? No? Oh, yes. Okay. Gertie? Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? Or Karen, can you unmute her? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I can't I was, quite see your name in the little block, so tell me. That's okay. That's okay. It's G-E-R-D. There we go. Okay. There's no space, I guess. Um, I was just wondering, in, in that, um, in, in, in the structure of the conscious, unconscious, the pyramid, where would you, how, how would you relate out-of-body experiences to that? I think it means dissociation. So I think what happens in an out-of-body experience, well, let me back up for a minute. Um, out-of-body experiences, if one has the ego strength and has, this, has the energetic presence, 
to be able to stay tethered enough to the body that what is experienced outside can come back into the body can be transformative. But too often what happens is that people have out-of-body experiences because they lose the tether. And I did not include this diagram in my slides, but if you can imagine for a minute a pie with, you know, 10 pie slivers. And what the work of individuation about is, in, is integrating. So we want all of the pie pieces which represent our experiences, our sensations, our perceptions, our images. We want them connected to the center of the pie. If you have an out-of-body experience, then that pie shape, which represents a sensation or perception an experience, an image, a felt sense, gets split off and it's not connected to the whole. If something is split off and not connected to the whole, when you need the energy that's locked into it, you have no access to it. Because in order to access it, it has to be in the pie, connected to the center. So out of body experiences and where I was going to, what I was going to say before giving anything, any other feedback is that it, it's dissociation. It's where one leaves oneself, you know, and there are spiritual practices and spiritual um, studies that teach people how to do that and encourage that. Um, I have had people end up in my office after having some of those experiences because they went psychotic for a few days, meaning they didn't have a body and a sense of self strong enough to pull them back in to make sense of what had happened. They got lost in it. So those things are occurring outside. What I also believe, though, is that there is always a little golden thread to that bit of self, even if that golden thread is not conscious. And so what often happens then for people who have out-of-body experiences, and again, I'm thinking of people who go to um, weekend workshops and they have experiences that just kind of blow them apart and they don't know what to make of it, that what eventually can happen is that little thread that does connect it to that center can become conscious. And with building a relationship to that experience, it can come back and be reintegrated. Hmm. When those experiences are reintegrated, we then have access to that energy. So the other thing is that, you know, if we think of the pie in each of those little slivers as just a little bit, a little pocket of energy, a little pocket of our life force. And if our life force gets split off outside of our body, we don't have access to it. I think this is the reason that there are so many people who um, are old before they're really old and chronologically is they lose all these little bits of their energy along the way. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the idea came when I was thinking of folks who had, um, who actually left their body, like let's say during uh, operations and or whatever, mm -hmm. and then look, looking down on their body being literally dis, you know, dissociated, but, but still seeing the body there. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and you wonder like, what is going on at that point in time? That was my curiosity. Well, I think in that situation, in terms of surgery or you need to use this? Yeah, no, my, near my. death experiences or, you know, feel like they died and came back and they were seeing the body. I think we're getting into a little bit different phenomena there than mm -hmm. the psychological phenomena we're talking about. And I think that has something to do with, you know, Jung ultimately in the later part of his life suggested that there is a realm he called the psychoid realm, P-S-Y-C-H-O-I-D. And he said that the psychoid realm is where spirit and matter are one instantaneously. So spiritual masters who work miracles actually are operating in what Jung would have called the psychoid realm. Synchronistic phenomena occurs in the psychoid realm. I recently watched a video interview with Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist, who's doing, the, the title of the video was uh, The Mind Extends Beyond the Body. 
and he's doing work on this flight, that there's something that moves beyond the limitation of the body. So um, I think that gets into a little bit different phenomena, but I think it, what Jung has to offer that is helpful for me in making sense of that is this idea that it's all energy. So whether it's energy that's disembodied or energy that's in matter, the psychic reality of the person, as long as that's intact in, an, in that energy center of the individual. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Is that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, someone who's on the iPhone, I see your hands raised. I don't see a name. Yeah. Yes, Noris. Noris? See, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my con I am in Mexico, so I'm not quite sure my connection will be, you know. But you just mentioned something that I actually wanted to, to ask you. Um, I have been doing, you know, I am a therapist myself, but I have been into Jungian analysts and work with many Jungian analysts through the years. And I'm right now in a particular kind of investigation and it has to do that a certain point of working, you know, with Marion Woodman, with all these Jungian analysts, I went more into a Eastern spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, you know, that kind of pointing directly to the self through silence and inquiry and just dropping fully. Mm -hmm. Then as I re-enter, I begin to look again into the Jungian work. And, uh, and because I, I, I document my dream for over 30 years mm -hmm. um, for where I come from. I'm from Dominican Republic. And I born in a countryside that dreams was the way how we have a spiritual life. It was what it was. So now I, I get very fascinated by looking at the parallelism between the individuation and the self-realization. Mm -hmm. And I am very fascinated to see the correlation of these two paths and how they really uh, convey the same mm -hmm. in, in a way. So, and... I'm right now doing more this um, navigation into the unconscious from, from another place, in, not from another place, from, but from a deeper kind of understanding that 20 years ago. So I am, and I work with uh, dreams and, and art and uh, active imagination through art. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a whole world of navigation or many different kinds of, of layers. So I wanted to hear a little bit from you about this multifaceted way how the individuation process take place. Yeah, so I think you're, you're asking me about um other perhaps other modalities or other spiritual traditions where individuation occurs but from a different point of view is that kind of what you're well no i was looking more from your perspective how do you see these multi layers of the individuation process you know you were you talk about the body which i think that that was very uh, uh remarkable for me because you're really giving uh, a substance to, to something that sometimes it can be very elusive because looking at the dream and the imagery, I can be sucked into the understanding of the dynamic. But when you talk about the body and then the images, then it gives another dimension. Okay, I think, I think let, me, let me respond this way and see if I get... Jung says that images arise from the depths of the body. That's a literal quote from Jung. Images arise from the depths of the body. So albeit we can all go to our dream books, we can all go to um, 
ARAS site and we can look up an image and all of its arch an archetypal image and all of its cross-cultural associations. Ultimately, the images that are going to pull you forward on your path are the images that arise from the depths of your body in your own dreams, in your own fantasies, in your own um, daydreams and longings and visions and hopes, in your own paranoias and um, catastrophic fantasies. Those are the images that are going to have the most power for you to relate to and dance with because they arise from the depth of your body. And Jung says, if you're in the presence of an archetype, you at simultaneously are experiencing an image and an emotion. That if you yes. are playing yes. with an image, or you're adopting an image because it's some powerful for someone else, then that image is it's fine. And you know, we can invoke and in, in, invoke archetypes. I mean, I think this is what all great spiritual traditions do when they begin their services or meditation periods with the prayer of invocation. Um, Edward Eninger actually says it this way very clearly. He says that talking about an archetype can invoke its presence. But <laughs> what happens, that invocation means the image constellates emotion or affect. And the power of transformation, the fire of the life force is in the emotion. So I love Yogananda's self-realization fellowship. You mentioned self-realization, and I don't know if you meant what tradition, but at Yogananda, um, his work and his center that um, promotes that, I think it's so consistent. John and I, we, re we have Yogananda's scientific healing affirmations, and one of his, um, one of the healing affirmations for the body is that um, my little cells are drinking, my little cells are drinking, their tiny mouths are shining, their tiny mouths are shining. And I just love it, you know, because I think it, it so speaks to that there is an essence uh, that comes in to us, both literally physically, but energetically also. And that our, the images, the thoughts we hold make a difference. So, Archetype is at once both image and emotion. And the when, when people, someone said this to me in the last couple of weeks, they said, how do I know what my archetypes are? I say, well, just look at what your affects are today. <laughs> if you want to know what archetypes are working you right now at this point in time in your life, what are the emotions you're struggling with? What's the overarching backdrop of affect or mood that you're, that you're dealing with? That'll tell you what the archetype is that's working you right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I hope that that. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I totally uh, understand and, 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 and see that connection very clearly because uh, all my work on the connection with the archetype through emerging and it's just right. Yeah. You, you have emotion, you have a sometimes overwhelming emotions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is gonna take me into talking about affect and complexes, but any other questions about the Jung's model of psyche before I go to that? Okay, yeah, Alan. Yeah, um, I'll try to be quick about this, but um, your, your talk got me thinking um, about the Kabbalah. Uh, system. Um, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I, I love Kabbalistic esoterica, <laughs> but um, the, okay, great, great. So um, this might, this might be too big a, a conversation to just dive into, but I'm thinking of the tree of life. Mm -hmm. That is the central schematic of the, of all of Kabbalah. Um, and it has a pillar of there. It's a tree that's has three pillars, mm -hmm. a pillar of a form, a pillar of force, which to me could be that image, the pillar of form, 
and the libido or energy uh, or affect could be the pillar of force. And then right up the middle, you have the pillar of balance, uh, which leads straight up to the higher self and beyond to the, uh, to the unconscious. Um, and you can really map those instinctual drives, I think, to that central pillar where, where you have uh, down in uh, the down at the bottom of the tree, you have um, movement and hunger in Malkut, which yeah. is the, you know, the very earthy body manifest part. Then you go up to the Yasod and you have uh, the, the lunar uh, realm of sexuality. Um, and then you have the uh, Tipareth, the Sephira of beauty, which is all about self-reflection and the higher self. And then you have the uh, straight up to the top of the tree, you have um, you have Keter at the top, which is sort of that synthesizing all, which is creativity, you know, seeing all the connections, you know. So I know that's a lot to unpack if someone's not familiar with Kabbalah, but. Um... <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm going to see if I can put my hand on a quick diagram, because since you shared that, it might make more sense to everybody. I have a slide to it, but I don't think I can pull the slide up real quickly. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with that, uh, with that schematic or with Kabbalah. Um, you know, it being a synthesis of um, it, it's it. A lot of the terminology is Jewish and was developed by uh, by Jews throughout the Middle Ages, but um, it started as a synthesis of. Uh, Greek and all, all the Mediterranean, uh, all the Hermetic stuff, and it all sort of came together. Uh, and Christians, you know, developed it as well. So it's a real melting pot of spiritual ideas. Yeah, so what I will also do, um, I'll send this to Karen to be able as a PDF, and then you can have it and any maybe post it if people want this. What Ellen's talking about is that uh, the tree of life, the way I think of it is um, a schematic or a blueprint of the energy of the divine that came into the world soul and the soul of humanity at the time of creation. And there are three pillars. This is pillar here is what's known as the pillar of force, which is we would say is spirit. This middle pillar is equilibrium, which I want to say is the human connected to the divine. And then this pillar is the pillar of form or matter. And that the energy begins up here in Kether, which is free flowing energy, divine purity, and it comes down the tree into a lightning flash. Now, what I want to just say that I think, again, is part of where Jung wasn't making the stuff up because he studied the Kabbalah. He studied the various esoteric traditions as well as the psychiatrists and philosophies of the day. On the tree of life, the final sphere is the earth plane and the, and the macrocosm. And in the microcosm, it's the body mind. It's our body mind. And that this sphere is the sphere of the body consciousness with its automatic reflective processes. Okay. And then, and, and this sphere of these two energies, and I don't know if you can see my writing, but we have a sphere that it's, represents our intellectual abilities and a sphere that represents our passions and desires and instincts. This, these two combined make up the mental plane. So we have the physical plane, our body, we have our emotional plane, our automatic body consciousness with its affects, its instincts and archetypes. Then we have the mental plane where our intellect and our desire nature, our heart and our head work together. And then we come up to the spirit of our spiritual nature of what in Jungian psychology would be the higher self. Okay. And it's a beautiful system for understanding the spiritual laws that operate in our psyche, as well as in the outer world of how things come into the visible, tangible realm. And if we understand that, and if, if you subscribe to this theory or not, I mean, let's face it, even if you, you know, um, in, in Christianity and, and people who even hold to the Bible, um, literally, 
St. Paul says the body is the temple of God. <laughs> you are the temple of God. So we have to begin to realize that our body isn't something that we can ignore, that we can throw away, or that's an albatross. And our culture has tended to not value the body as being important, relevant, psychic, spiritual information. It very much got hijacked in the Western world by science and everything that had to be done from a rationalistic, materialistic point of view. But as you just experienced, and as Michael shared, when he put his hands down and could palpate the energy, he felt that there's something beyond the body other than what our scientific instruments can prove. You know? And Rupert Sheldrake is working in his own way from a scientific paradigm to try to substantiate that so that the scientific world will accept what he, what he knows is true and, and we know is true. Yeah, so. So let me segue here to um, go back to my screen share. Let's see, share screen. Um, okay. So one of the things that I did not um, say straight out by itself in the beginning was that one of the things that was really important for Jung and his work was to prove the reality of the psyche and he says that there is a psychic real reality that stands alone and the reason that was so important to him was what I just said in the early 1900s he as well as a lot of others I mean uh, Rudolf Steiner you know the Hermetic Orders the Golden Dawn Society the Rosicrucians the Masonic Order there were a lot of people in both the spiritual world the psychological world um, the psychiatric medical world who were saying you know what we are more than just what the rationalistic materialistic mindset says we are or we can prove that there is a real a psychic reality and that that psychic reality is known to us through our own libido and for young libido meant psychic energy he connected libido to the eastern concept of chi it's the life force that flows through us and he says that life force is reflected through instinctive drives through wishes through will, and I wanted to find will as the quantity of conscious energy we can access to focus toward a given goal. So will here means the quantity of conscious energy we can access to focus towards a given purpose. Affect, and then performance, and performance here would better, um, a better word there would be movement or activity things that we do. So I want to talk specifically about affects because my experience in my work is the reason people come into analysis or the reason that people come and, and um, want to do the embodiment practices that I offer online is because they're having experiences in their body-mind and they want to better know how they can work with them. And Tompkins in the late in the early 60s was a developmental psychologist who said that there are non innate affects and what he he determined this based on doing infant observation so you may look at this list and say well what about this what about this and what I would say is that it would probably fit as an expression of one of these Okay. And Sylvan Tompkins, there's a website that has lots of good information if you're interested more in this. But the non-innate categorical affects are distress, which includes pain, desperation, sadness, rage, anger, disgust, contempt, joy, surprise, slash startle, interest, curiosity, fear, and shame. Now, part of what's interesting is Tompkins in his research did not observe fear or shame until the infants were a few weeks old. So some theorists 
would question whether or not they're innate or they actually are a learned response based on interaction with the environment. But Tompkins did include those in his system. So I wanted you to see what the affects are before we look at the anatomy of a complex. Complex is Jung's word to describe what I call a feedback loop. It is a um, kind of a, a little template, a, an energy system that works its own way. Let's talk about it that way. And the core or heart of that energy system is an affect. And you'll notice here that I have it listed as archetype as affect slash instinctive impulse. I really want you to begin to get that how we first encountered the archetypes are in the affects. And an affect is a strong emotion with bodily innervation. A strong emotion with bodily innervation. The body is activated. You feel it in your body. Something's going on in the central nervous system. And the way that these feedback loops form is we have these affects, these archetypal, instinctive, automatic responses that for whatever reason, we aren't able to fully experience, so they don't get integrated. And again, think about integration as like digestion. If you integrated your lunch, you digested it, which means that your body broke it down, it absorbed the nutrients it could use, and it's preparing to excrete the others, okay? There's a psychological process of integration that goes on that's the same thing. We're able to absorb what's needed and let go of what's not useful. But if that process gets interrupted, and it most often gets interrupted for us human beings because when we express an affect, we encounter resistance from the people around us. We're told we're bad, we're told it's wrong, we're told we shouldn't feel that way. Um, we're scared, we're put down, we're humiliated. Something happens or maybe no one responds. And that lack of response creates a paralysis. So something happens and that affect doesn't get integrated or slash digested. So then what starts to happen is every time you feel that affect, unconsciously, those experiences kind of form a layer around it. It's kind of like, um, you know, the affect that doesn't get integrated or metabolized forms the core and then layers form over it. And those layers are other experiences that share your feeling that same affect. Then on top of that are all of the collective ideas about that feeling, all of the things you see in movies, all of the stories you hear the people around you tell. And that forms another layer about how you should or shouldn't relate to that affect. And then there's this experience of the disembodied, where all of a sudden we may experience that feeling as coming outside of us from someone else in a monstrous or, or angelic way. It's as if something is out there that's bigger than life. Okay. If we are going to individuate, then we have to be able to find that seed essence within our complexes. And we have to be able to begin to create a space where we feel safe enough in the outer world, usually with someone else, analysis does this, and within ourselves, where those layers can start to get peeled back. Okay? And as the layers are peeled back, then we can get to that early, early experience that couldn't get integrated and begin to relate to it consciously. 
And my favorite quote by Jung is Jung says, by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious, we can mitigate the negative effects of the unconscious. I'll say it again, by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious, we can mitigate the negative effects of the unconscious. We have no control over our unconscious. <laughs> Remember I said that will is defined as the quantity of conscious energy we, have, we can access to focus at will. But we can influence the unconscious. And I believe if there's one Jungian technique that if we did nothing else, it would be to engage and dialogue with what goes on inside of us. And that's what Jung called active imagination. That, you know, if I start to feel this kind of fieriness in my stomach and I have no idea what it means, that I just stop and I talk to it. I listen. I say, what do you want to tell me? And then whatever comes into my mind's eye in terms of image or in terms of thought or in terms of the feeling, I honor it and I listen. And I can keep exploring it. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Gendlin's technique of focusing. Are any of you familiar with Gendlin's work on focusing? Focusing is a beautiful form of active imagination, in my opinion, where he invites you to start with a body sensation and ask whatever word, phrase, or image that best describes the whole of it to drop out of it. And then just resonate with that image or word or phrase. And then if that seems to get stuck, then again, invite whatever word or phrase or image that best describes the whole of it out of it. Until you get to a place where, where you feel that this is it. <laughs> and, you know, um, Jung says that the best method of dream interpretation is the it clicks method. That means it clicks with you. <laughs> the same thing with the focusing. When you get to a place where it clicks, it's like, oh, yeah, that's it. We feel it. Something in our body physiologically registers. Yeah, yeah, I know that. And then to ask that what it needs from you and to say to it what you need from it. And it's a beautiful way to work with the body and do active imagination that moves forward. And I'll also send to Karen to post a little cliff notes on the steps of focusing that um, to, to make available to you all too. I didn't include that in, in what I had done. So, so by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious. Now, sometimes people say, okay, so how do I know if I'm in a complex? Well, you're gonna know if you're in a complex because you're going to be feeling an out of proportion emotion or an out of proportion bodily response. And you know it's out of proportion, you know. Um, you will have difficulty remembering what happened afterwards. Over the years, I've done a lot of couples counseling. Inevitably, the couple walks into my office and say, oh, we had a knockdown, drag out fight on Sunday. And now we can't even remember what it was about. <laughs> Well, they can't remember because whatever triggered the argument isn't really what it was about, but whatever it was activated some complexes, and they can't remember. When we're caught in a complex, so to speak, we can't think. And by think, I mean we can't see the big picture or put the pieces together. It's like we've got tunnel vision. You know? So this is where, again, if the... the um, a classic example of an argument with someone you love and you you all you can do is say the same thing over and over and over again <laughs> and then afterwards you think of all this other things that are pertinent but in that moment you couldn't access them so we're caught in a, those are signs we're caught in a complex it means this unconscious energy center that has at its center a core affect whether it's anger disgust contempt shame or joy you know, or surprise. There are many, many people who are unable to really feel their own joy and delight in things. 
You know, a complex gets activated and they freeze. And there are people who really have been shamed for their curiosity and their sense of surprise and awe. And they're not able to really have that emotion in response to human connection or a work of beauty or a work of art. So the complexes don't just form around, quote, the undesirable emotions. They can also form around the um, affects that we want, the more pleasurable ones. So by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious, we can mitigate the negative effects. The other thing I want to add in here is that Jung's early work with the word association test, which actually led to him to develop his theory of the complex, began with the word association test, which this was going on in the early 1900s, and Jung was at the um, premier psychiatric hospital of the day, the Berkholsey, and a couple of other psychiatrists there were already doing research with the word association test, where they would read a list of words, and while they were reading that list of words, they were tracking how much time it took for the person to respond to the word with the first thing that popped into their head. And as they were timing them, they also had them hooked up to a gallon meter where they were measuring their heart rate, their skin temperature, and their respiration rate. Okay, all bodily things, all, if we go back to this tree of life again, what they were tracking is what was going on here at this spear of Yassau that's connected with the automatic unconscious bodily processes. That's what they were tracking. And what they, Jung determined, or theorized at the time, is that whenever there was a change in the physiology of the body, i.e. the heart rate got faster or slowed down, or the breathing got faster or slowed down, or the skin temperature changed, and there was a delay in the time of the response, that that indicated the activation of some unconscious content. <clears throat> that is what he formulated his theory of complexes on. <laughs> so I think it's so important for us to remember, I've got my water bottle here, it's so important for us to remember that one of the primary tenets that is so big in pop psychology from Jung, the theory of the complex, got started by Jung tracking bodily responses. Okay? This is why having practices of tuning in to what's going on in your body is so important. Because if you're going to begin to, to know where your complexes are, and if you ever have a chance of not um, getting caught in them, <laughs> meaning all of a sudden you find your blood going, you know, from zero to 120 in a nanosecond, but you're with somebody you really don't want to act out towards, if you're ever going to have a chance to stop that, you're going to have to catch it because you notice what's going on in your body. Because if you wait to hear it coming out of your mouth, you're going for the ride. <laughs> Does that make sense? So being in our body is so, so important because it's the primary source of information for us about when something in our own unconscious is activated. Okay? We can wait until we have a, quote, negative interaction with somebody, or we can wait until we have an accident, or we have an illness, or we can wait until we have a dream. And there's nothing wrong if that's what you want to do, but what about tuning in right now to what's available? Because if we tune in right now to what's available, then we can begin to develop that psychic muscle. <laughs> And if we go back to that ego self-axis, that ego self-axis comes down through the body. We can begin to develop that psychic muscle 
where we have access to that information when it most matters, i.e. because we've cultivated that psychic muscle of tracking what goes on inside of us, we will feel the subtle nuances of change in our heart rate, our breathing, our own central nervous system activation as we go through our life. And we then can register, oh, something's gotten triggered. And this is what I know about it. And it can all happen in a flash because you've developed that muscle. You've built that relationship of conscious to unconscious. So I wanted to be sure to, to share that with you because Jung's comments about the body are, spe are scattered. Even as I pull together quotes, you know, they're scattered in the two primary volumes, seven and eight, which really are the heart of Jung's theory. But people just kind of gloss over them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't really stop and slow down. And <clears throat> part of the reason that I think that's so is that if we do slow down to deal with our bodies, then we have to acknowledge our limitations. You know? So like when Natalie shared, she was aware that she was just kind of tired from not resting, but also she was a little hyped up and agitated. When we start to tune in and get that kind of information, then something's going to automatically start working inside of us. And we're probably going to find ourselves beginning to think about doing something differently. And then we're going to be required to take action to do something differently. And even though living and being alive is synonymous with change, all we have to do is look at fall right now. Okay, we're in the season of fall. If, if anything living is always changing, somehow the human being wants to resist that. <laughs> And the idea that if we have to change our routine or change our schedule or, you know, change our focus at work or change our personal routines that we've done something wrong. And so we have to give that notion of right and wrong up and begin to say, okay, what is it that my rhythms need now? And how do I move forward toward wholeness, toward balance? Because if we go back to that image of the tree of life, the pillar that we are aspiring to is that middle pillar where things are in balance or what I also like to talk about as sacred reciprocity, <laughs> that there is this intertwining where both sides get their due. So <clears throat> I'm checking in to see exactly what's most important to go to next because we've got about 35 minutes left and I want to also allow time for more questions and comments. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I want to say this. Um, May I make a comment? Uh, oh, yes. Absolutely. I, mean, I don't mean to interrupt your thread, but, yeah. but I'm struck by a, a picture. If I understand correctly, um, a, a grain of sand inside of an oyster begins to make layers yeah. And ultimately, we call that a pearl. Mm -hmm. It feels to me, though, that the dilemma is more like Robert Johnson's mandorla, because when you talk about uh, complexes and things that happen in early childhood that are painful and difficult, they also get layers built upon it. But my, it, it's hard to make a pearl and not allow the grain of sand to still be there undigested and unformed. And that when I when I mean Mandorla, that's what I'm thinking of as Robert Johnson and, and von Franz discussed that. It, it's the, the situation of polarities that there's no solution. Uh, and, and until there's something that's evanescent and not in the same time span, that to me would be pearl-like. Mm -hmm. But it seems in normal life, uh, I struggle, I feel myself getting triggered in complexes. Uh, some sense of awakening at age 74 from childhood events. So it's like, this is not easy. Yeah, you know, it isn't easy. And um, you're absolutely, 
you're absolutely right. There's nothing easy about individuation. You know, I always say the path of individuation is not for sissies. I mean, it takes tremendous courage. Um, you know, one of the images I sometimes use to describe complexes is they're like helium balloons and that, that the hot air is the, our own unmetabolized emotion and felt experience. The spirit in us is kind of that is not integrated into our body is like the helium that blows up the hot air balloon. And that over time, what happens with consciousness and through analysis, hopefully, and the spiritual and psychological practices you all are doing is that that helium gets let out of the balloon and the balloon shrinks. And people will say to me, well, does the complex ever go away? And I say, no, the complex never goes away, but it shrinks because we can't change our history. So the other thing I think that's important to this conversation is that the, whatever those experiences are that blocked the integration of that affect at that moment in time cannot be changed. But what can change is our present day relationship to it, our present day felt sense in response to it. And if we go through the layers or if we go through the bits of energy that come in through the air, let's just say we breathe the, you know, the air becomes, um, well, I would have to go to the water image here, but, you know, water crystal, but it comes in and it gets integrated because we do know that the air comes into our body and something is extracted from it, even though we don't see it visibly in the outside world, there is an element that our body organically extracts. It's the same way with our psyche. When we go back through these experiences and the felt sense of it in a safe space where we can keep ourselves both experiencing it, but outside of it at the same time, outside but related, then something gets extracted from it that's integrated and that changes our experience that's the shrinking of the complex but the complex is always there um, because it's, it's just a part of the building blocks of who we are but what changes is the power it has yeah yeah no no um, yeah any anything else other comments or questions I keep thinking of the word uh, authenticity Mm -hmm. um, and authenticity being a kind of uh, choice where, where you have the, the choice, you're giving yourself the choice to react or not. And the authentic you is the one that chooses uh, the feelings that are authentic to you, that are, that are, you know, rather than that being imposed on you and you being triggered, um, something along those lines. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if we think about it, and um, if we if we go back to my diagrams, and if I knew where I could put my hands on one real, really quick, I'd grab it, but my diagram of the pie, and so here's the pie with all the slivers connected in the pie to the center, and a, and a mandala is a better way of describing this, and then here's the mandala with certain elements of it outside of the mandala, outside of the larger circle then if something's floating around outside we don't have access to it let's think for the minute for a minute if we go back to the the pie shape with all the pieces in the middle and let's just right now refer to it as a mandala so we've got the large circle with all the pieces and then in the center is another circle and let's just say that circle represents the larger self even though diagrammically right now it isn't the larger part, but it's the larger self. Then if something, when we get activated into my shrunk helium balloon complex of uh, feeling not good enough, okay? I recently got triggered into that. I was going to be doing a video one morning that um, is a part of a project James Hollis invited me to be a part of. I'm reviewing my notes and I went into my I'm not academic enough complex. 
<laughs> that was the form that morning. My, I'm not good enough. I'm just a poor little girl, Southern Baptist girl, which I was, um, got triggered. And I was able to laugh about it. And then kind of, you know, halfway through the presentation, the person who was filming it was like, oh my God, I've never taken so many notes in an hour of presentation ever. This is fantastic. And I just laughed. I thought, yeah. And there was my, I'm not good enough, academic enough complex. Okay. It's always there. And if we know them, then even when they're kicking in, we can kind of laugh at them. I know last month, James Hollis talked to you all about humor. You know, humor goes a long way in helping us get out, get outside of something and the sense of being able to relate to it to keep the bit of ourself that's threatening to be swallowed by it. Okay. So if we can play with that image, then what happens in that moment, I can't get outside of it unless my larger self or what Alan's calling the authentic self if unless there's enough of me connected to that authentic self that center point then i'm not going to be able to hear what my authentic self says following me yeah so you know if instead of all 50 bits of me i hate to think i have that many bits but <laughs> let's make it 20 that feels more manageable if all 20 bits of me are here then my authentic self has got a lot i i i i've I've got states that I can access the authentic self much more quickly. But if 10 of those are split off, you know, it's, it's kind of like having an eight cylinder car and going on five cylinders, you know? And so I think that part of also what is important, we have to remember that even the complex has a seed of the authentic self. One time I was doing presentation and I actually entitled it, Every Complex Has a Seed of the Self. So if we go back to the oyster and the grain of sand, you know, there, that grain of sand is the seed of the self. But sometimes what happens in the layering is instead of the pearl that, that we want getting formed, something distorted and ugly gets formed. Okay. But that seed is of the authentic self. And I think that's also really important because we tend to want to dismiss certain of our affects and emotions and patterns as being something bad or something that's monstrous that we just need to get rid of. Well, what we need to do is go down in and through it and find that seed of the self. Find the grain of sand that is authentically you. Because once you are relating to that, then something new can grow from it. Yeah. And maybe that's a good place to segue to in these last uh, few minutes together before we take other questions, is that um, for me, individuation basically is summarized in the, in the Christian story of incarnation. God become human being, God become man. And that what Jung offers us is a way to make sense of what that means in light of our human experience. Because if we're going to embody the divine essence, then we have to be human. The human being, if we believe the various spiritual traditions around the world, created in the image of the divine. But what's happened in the process of the puritanical teachings and all of what is the historical backdrop associated with mainstream Christianity is the body got demonized. And in the process of the body getting demonized, we lost access to that which is fundamental to how we experience life as long as we're in a body. Okay. In other words, if you're in a body, there are going to be automatic processes. 
there are going to be instinctive and archetypal images that arise. If you're in a body, Jung says, we're not a tabula rasa. We don't come out a blank slate. <laughs> we are born with this strata of the collective unconscious and with our own larger self innate nature under it. So if we're only trying to take in from out here, the shoulds, must, and ought tos and the teachings, and we learn to tamp down what's coming up from inside of us, then you can see how skewed things get <laughs> and how skewed things have gotten. So ultimately, incarnation, which is, is the myth of the Western world, is about embodiment. It is about divine essence becoming flesh. And part of what Jung offers us is a way to work with that and understand that that can help to mitigate the centuries of the demonization of our own being. And again, it's a paradox because if we go back, even let's say in Christianity to the sacred text, Genesis says we are created in the image of God. St. Paul says that the body is the temple of God. But somewhere over the last 2,000 years, things got skewed. <laughs> things got very skewed. And, you know, I believe everything, I very much believe the Jungian principle of compensation. And so I'm sure there were compensations at work in the larger scheme of things. But where we're at right now, and this cusp of this new era, era in our world and what the astrologers talk about as the age of Aquarius is how do we really begin to understand consciously and consciously use in a lovingly powerful and powerfully loving way this reality of our psyche where we do have access and connection to these larger than life archetypal and instinctive energies because they are within each of us and we see them played out over and over and over again in the collective outside world and politics and economics etc cetera, etc cetera. We have to begin to relate to these sides of our own nature, however it is we have experiences of spirit and however it is we understand our energy system, our life force, and relate to the matter that we are, the cellular material being that we are, and realize that they are one and the same. <laughs> As Jung says, they're different densities of the same energy. One end is the ultraviolet, the other end is the infrared. And when we begin to relate to ourself day in and day out in this way, then something starts to happen that frees up blocked libido that frees up our blocked psychic energy our essence and one of the hearts of Jung's teachings is the what he had to say about the transcendent function how many of you are familiar with the transcendent function so just quickly and interestingly enough, the essay on the transcendent function was not published, I think, until the 40s or 50s, but he actually wrote it back, I think, the original version, version back in the late teens or 20s. But, um, and I might not have those dates exactly right, but there was a, there was a significant gap. Jung described the organic, innate, unconscious process by which 
opposites are united and a uniting third emerges as the transcendent function. So that the work, our work of consciousness and the work of the ego is to consciously hold the tension of the opposites that go on inside of us and invite this uniting third to emerge. We cannot make that happen. It is an organic process. I always tell people it's like gardening. What we do is the work of psychic gardening. <laughs> Just like those of you who may be planting your fall flowers, you can plant them, you can fertilize, you can water, but you can't make them grow. Okay. The same is true within our psyche. We can do active imagination. We can study Jung. We can do this. We can do that. But that transcendent function whereby things are united, the opposites in our nature unite, and we move forward with a sense of wholeness, which brings a sense of peace and calm deep within us, is an organic process. And so the process of building a conscious relationship to the unconscious is an automatic holding of the tension of the opposites. By my even talking you to you today and you're taking in cognitively and intellectually what I'm saying, at the same time tracking how it hits you in your body, what it feels like to you, where you agree, where you disagree, where you're bored, where you're excited, that's beginning to hold the tension of the opposites in your own nature. When we relate to our dreams, our night dreams, the dream is a communication from the unconscious. So by playing with those images and relating to those, we are holding the tension of the opposites and inviting a uniting third. When we started today with our breath and the body scan, we were using our ego consciousness, which had come into this setting, into this circle, with ideas about what was going to happen and whatever feelings you were having and your body having gotten here in the middle of the afternoon. We were holding that consciousness to open and see what's going on unconsciously, what's going on that we don't know. And that act of attention is a way of holding the tension of the opposites. And something happened. Shifts happen. Some of you shared you felt shifts in how you were feeling. Maybe your expectations about today shifted. So as we can consciously hold the tension of the opposites, then embodiment happens. And the most important opposites for us to pay attention to are our cognitive intellectual thoughts and our desires and feelings and affects. And if we begin to track how they are interacting and we begin to look deep enough within each of those to find the seed, the grain of sand, then something within you, that authentic self within you, can find a way to show up now, to show up in your body now with a different emotion, with a different felt state, to show up with your thinking, with your self-talk, with your desires, with your choices. That's what embodiment means. And if we don't pay attention to our body, then we miss the point and we go on this journey of mental gymnastics. And for me, this is the shadow of Jungian work. I think the shadow of Jungian work is it lends itself to mental gymnastics. You know, it's a lot more fun to play with archetypal images than it is to feel our own experiences of abandonment and humiliation or to feel our own overwhelming joy and ecstasy. Okay? Because 
we haven't had the support or the containers or the education to really know how to be present to our own experience in a way that it doesn't feel so hard. <laughs> And that ultimately to what Michael was saying is this is hard work. It's hard because we're having to undo years and decades and centuries of responding differently to the embodied experience. Okay. The beautiful thing about it is the more that we play and hold the tension of the opposites within our nature, there is a way where that sense of hardness does shift. There are still moments where it's like, oh my God, but it shifts. It's kind of like if you think about it, you start to build up this internal reservoir of knowing, okay, that's all this is and I'll get through it. And suddenly that helps to shrink the overwhelming feeling. So the more we go through this, the more of the experiences we have where those complexes shrink, where we hold the tension of the opposites and that third emerges and we are feeling and experiencing it in our body because we're paying attention, then we begin to have this reservoir of support that does make it, I'm just going to say, it makes it easier to keep going forward. <laughs> You know, um, and that's kind of, uh, I'm, I'm chuckling because I'm not really sure that's the right word to use, but it, there is something about it. It's kind of like we get to a point where we know, yeah, this may be hard, but this over here is even harder. <laughs> you know, we get to a place where we realize that the cost of staying unconscious is way more than whatever the cost is of consciousness or the pain we'd have to endure staying unconscious is far greater than whatever pain we endure getting conscious. And I say this sometimes to my um, analysis. Years ago, I had a man who came to me for analysis, and I can remember him coming in a year or two later. And um, he said, you know, being honest sure does cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. But what he was commenting on is that getting honest with himself and thus the changes that have set off in the outside world um, had created a lot of trouble. Things were blowing up. I mean, things were changing. But he was saying it to me with a laugh because at the same time, it had caused a lot of trouble. He was already experiencing that deeper satisfaction of the inner and the outer being congruent. And that is what happens in individuation. It's what happens in incarnation. It's what happens in self-realization, enlightenment, or whatever word you want to use for it, is that the inner and the outer become congruent. And there is a power and an eros, a love in that, that either side alone can never, ever access and manifest. So... Yeah. So we have just a, a few minutes left. So I don't know if Karen, if you have anything to say or Gail, and if there are any other questions that you want or comments. I actually had a question and a comment. Okay. Um, so much of what you're saying is resonating with one of my initial questions before you even started today. Um, and maybe this is more theoretical or symbolic, but, you know, we have the individual body, the collective body, the earth body, and you were touching on this a minute ago, uh, about what's going on in the world today. And I'm thinking about the archetypes of health and illness. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like this is a time of in individuation for all three. And I was just wondering if you could say more about that. I mean, it's an incredible transformation. Um, but I'm wondering what you have to say about that. Just about the personal individuation around one's own health and... Well, almost all three. The personal, there's the collective body, and then there's, uh, I think, the earth body. She maybe has uh, fared 
the most beneficially <laughs> for the last two years. Um, but I'm just wondering what you have to say about that. Yeah. So, so this is what I will say is that if one part is sick, then it makes the whole sick. <laughs> and so if I do my work to be as healthy as I can physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, then, you know, I, I am contributing to the health of the larger body and thus the health of the earth and that the earth and the collective body is only going to be as healthy and lovingly powerful and powerfully loving as each of the individual parts I each each of us and so um, that's where I put my focus is for myself and then the work I do with people one-on-one -on -one. Um, I think that there are places for people who are called to look at helping larger systems shift one of the things that Jung says is that, um, and this he talks about in terms of mob psychosis, mob hysteria, mob psychosis, is that a group can only attain to the level of consciousness that is the um, highest common denominator. So that means the person with the lower level of consciousness determines the level of consciousness of the group because the group can only operate at the highest common denominator got it so so i do believe that there are people who are very evolved and i think spiritual masters who are able to hold a center of energy that can pull a group to a new level i think gandhi did that i i'll never forget as a child seeing the movie about Gandhi and that beautiful scene where he and all of his followers laid down in front of the British army coming on horses. You know, he had a power to pull people into a different level of consciousness. I think, of course, Jesus had that. I think that the Buddha had that. I think there are the great spiritual teachers and leaders have that. But I think that's really what we have to aspire towards is how do we be the one in a group that might help the group stay above that lowest common denominator, that highest lowest common denominator. Yeah. And the other thing I think we have to say when we look at all of what's going on, and I think this is also so true about what we've been experiencing with the pandemic, is the principle of compensation is always at work. You know, um, it breaks my heart every time I go down the two lane highway that I used to be out in the country and now all the, the trees keep getting cut down. And I keep thinking, what happened to our understanding from like elementary school science that we need the trees to make oxygen to breathe? I mean, you know, all of these things are, are affecting things and we just each have to find our own way to be a part of the solution, you know. Yeah, Florine. Oh, let's see. We have to. Un Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. I just want to thank you. Um, I need to to leave the group right now, and I I just want to tell you how much this has meant to me personally, and just a little comment on the idea of the transcendent function. For many, many years of my life, I've looked at what I called my law of threes. So the one and the two was bringing the opposites together to form the third. But then at some point in my life, it became an awareness for me that there is a fourth. Mm -hmm. And that fourth is really transcendent to the third because it overviews it. And that's all I have to say, because I don't understand any more of it. But thank you so much. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Florine. And what I will say is you're referring to something that uh, a, a female alchemist said it as out of the one comes the two, out of the two comes the three, and out of the three comes the four as one. So, yes. Yes. and for Jung, the four, of course, was a symbol of the self. Of the self, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. 
Michael? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you saw my unmute there. I'm thinking about, I, I worked for a dozen years producing Matter of Heart and interviewing folks in Switzerland and so forth. And, I, and I'm remembering von Franz talking about the, 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 the uh, terrible vision that Jung had for humanity in the, in, the, in the 60s and how she was not able to really look at it. And it ties into something that Karen has said because we, we had talked about it before you came on and that is the presence of COVID. Mm -hmm. So it strikes me that COVID also represents potentially something that came out of nature that has the capability of destroying our humanity. And, it's, and um, I, I, that, that seems to me to be such an elemental level of challenge. Uh, and, it's, and it's like the, the, there's the layer of humanity that, that is coming to the forward to be able to find some antidote, at least in part, for the impact of it. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because it seems we're in it. And to take it back to something positive, we're in a circle that you identified at the very beginning of our talk. We are here in solitude, but sharing our images with one another. So there, there, there's, a, there's, there's something in there that, that I didn't want to let go without going back to the fundamental challenge of COVID. Yeah, and what I want to say in response to that is, you know, one of the things I've learned, um, and I was doing a fair amount of work by teleconferencing prior to COVID, so it was not new to me, but I feel connected to those of you today. And it isn't what I would feel, the same connection I would feel if I were physically in the room. But there's a connection. And I, I led um, right prior to the shutdown, I was um, going to be lead, co-leading a pilgrimage to Iona with Jerry Wright. And when we couldn't go, I offered a pilgrimage by teleconference for five days for whoever wanted to come. And of, I think, the 36 people who um, were going to go on the pilgrimage, uh, I think like 32 participated. 28 of those showed up every day for five days in a row for two to three hours. And at the end of it, one of the people said, you know, I feel such an intimate connection to each and every one of you. And I wonder if it might not even be deeper because I could see each of your faces close up in this medium. And if we had been in a big room and a large circle, I wouldn't know. So I think it's different. And I think that the challenge is that we redefine what it means to be human, perhaps, or what humanity means. And, you know, Jung says, when all else is resolved, when all the projections are resolved, what we are left with is kinship libido, which is the need for human connection. And for me, what human connection is, is the shared felt sense. And there's a group of out of Boston called the Boston Process Change Study Group. It's a um, diverse group of professionals, both neuroscience, developmental psychologists, psychoanalysts, Jungian analysts, who come together and they've been trying to figure out what is it that something more that makes a relationship healing, that makes it different. And what they found is what they're calling moments of meeting. It doesn't matter what your therapy orientation is. It doesn't matter what theory you use. None of that ma what matters is, are there moments of meeting? Are there those human connection? And I'm sure moments of meeting invokes a feeling in you all. You all know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like to have an interaction face-to-face -face with someone and there is no moment of meeting. But you come here and there's a moment of meeting. There's human connection. And... I also will say this, I think to connect virtually and have moments of meaning requires even more that we be in our bodies. <laughs> it's as if in order to connect vis-a-vis -vis this format, we have to be even more in our bodies to pick up the subtle interior senses. Yeah. So I think embodiment is more important than ever. Yeah. So... Well, it has been terrific to be with you all today. So thank you all for, for being with me and having me here. And um, 
I, I, you know, my website is Kathleen Wiley, Jungian Analyst.com, just my name and Jungian Analyst, and also InnerDivineSpirit.com. And if you go to InnerDivineSpirit.com, there's a little, um, in the header, it'll say Online Sacred Circles. And if you're interested in the essential embodiment practices, or I'm also going to be doing um, a companion to my book of meditations for Advent. So there's information there on both of those if you want to access those. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. And um, when you give me those two handouts, we'll post that uh, on our website. And there were many moments of meaning, uh, both energetically and intellectually. Um, so thank you so much. And for the rest of you, uh, have a good rest of the day and save the day for November 14th for Jeannie Sewell, uh, who will continue to uh, piggyback on the importance of embodiment. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Right. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.